All right, let's talk about the pump. Does it build muscle? Well, yes and no. Now, the pump itself may actually contribute to muscle hypertrophy, but probably a small effect. Here's the real benefit. The fact that you can get a good pump signals that a lot of things are going right. In other words, if you're well hydrated, well fed, not overtrained, and your training is appropriate, oftentimes you'll get an incredible pump. So the growth and the hypertrophy people attribute to the pump is probably more connected to the things that allow you to get a good pump. In other words, to get a good pump, a lot of things are working right. Is this your uh, favorite subject? No, yes, why? Yes. Why? Because it makes favorite. you look awesome. Oh, I know it does. It makes you look awesome. No, it's you like know, I'm coming. This is a good. This is a good uh, topic because um, the supplement industry is tapped into the uh, I don't know what you want to call it emotional value of the pump. Right? Everybody loves that feeling, right? They love that feeling of of, of their muscles inflating and feeling tight when they work out. Um, and so, supplement industry there's a huge market for quote unquote enhancing the pump or improving yeah. the ability to get a pump. They uh, figured but, that out like immediately. Oh, I remember when that market first happened because there were no pump supplements when I first started lifting. I mean, it's equivalent yeah. to caffeine in pre-workouts. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, I mean, it's totally. like, that's what of all the, the stuff feeling. Yeah. Of everything that's going on in a pre-workout or maybe the, even the, is it Arginine or Citrulline? I always forget Both. which one does the tingly. Yeah. Oh, which oh one? beta alanine. Oh, beta alanine. Yeah. That's what it is. You yeah. know, it's funny too, by the way, just off topic or side, side uh, topic here. <clears throat> The best thing for a better pump is water, sodium, and carbs. There's like no yes. amino acid you could take. There's no nothing, no PD-5 inhibitor, whatever. They'll give you a better pump than having enough water, enough sodium, and some carbohydrates. It doesn't even come close. But it really, it's just the fact, like, I can tell when my hydration is good, I've had good sleep, I'm not overtrained, that, you know, maybe my training's appropriate. <clears throat> oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes by the kind of pump that I get in the gym. When I get a really good pump, although I like that feeling, I know like a lot of things are going right. On the other side, you know, you ever try to get a good pump when your diet is off or when you're not hydrated or when you got poor sleep? It just doesn't happen. Yeah. So I think the gains that people attribute to the pump itself is more attributed to what caused you to get that good pump. And the reason why I'm communicating that is so that people focus on those things more than anything, more than the pump itself. More than chasing the I mean, it's, that's a something. really interesting theory. I wonder how you would test that hypothesis, right? Like, how would you test the the main, main benefits of the pump is less to do with what it's doing as far as stimulating and growth of the muscle and more to do with connectivity and and the, the after effects of, the, yeah. of that uh, than it is the actual pump there is, itself. There is some evidence that shows, that suggests that the waste build up from the the pump itself might also the cell swelling effects might also contribute to muscle growth but again i'll go back to what i said um if you're overtrained you got poor sleep and you're, you're not hydrated and all those things you're not getting a good pump so it's hard to kind of separate and parse it out and then on the flip i've followed training programs that give you very little pump like pure strength training low rep three reps mm -hmm. yeah. long rest period. you don't get a pump when you train like that that's and yet I, you see muscle growth. It's like a foreign concept to me still to this day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I told you for the longest time, I was trapped in this way of training. You thought and, that was everything. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was everything. And one of the things that always used to bother me when in my first, say, like, you know, five to 10 years of training was that I'd, I'd get this great pump in the gym and I would like, oh, I love the way my physique looks and feels right now. And then you deflate and you're like, oh, if I could just keep that look. And then I, I remember as a, as a young, younger kid lifting that, I used to be like, man, I don't even feel like I look like I work out until I'm actually working out. Then yeah. I feel like I look I work out. Yeah. Then when I was introduced to heavy, and, but, and that's for, I guess, at least five years, I didn't train really, really heavy, low rep range at all. Like, small times of my training career in early on, I would enter into the six rep range, like for an exercise or two and then move right back. out. I was always, but definitely not ten. singles and doubles. Yeah. Oh yeah. That. Never any of that. And rarely ever did I even run like a true, like five by five block. Like I never did that ever. I just introduced some, and normally the exercises were things like uh, bicep curls. Oh wow. Yeah, definitely. Of were. All things. Yes. Of all things. And transitioning out of, away from that and into you know, singles, doubles, triples, five by five, traditional type training, uh, may not have made my body look as impressive in the gym as far as airing me up or like inflating me like the muscles, but the, the kind of granite hard look that it gave my physique all day long was 
tr- a huge difference. And I wish that we had better studies to support that case. I yeah, just, there's none, right? Um, but you, I guess you could point to old bodybuilding wisdom uh, and, and what they kind of point to. And what do bodybuilders say? Well, the pump is the pump is important, but also so is heavy strength training um, or just getting stronger. In fact, I think anybody with lots of experience will tell you, especially the first three years, nothing's more important than getting stronger. It's like nothing will get you moving forward like getting strong. Now, at some point, that tends to plateau because you can't get stronger forever. Mm-hmm. And then it gets a little bit more, more granular. But again, I like to communicate this because there's this whole market. I, I, would, mm-hmm. I would guess that besides protein powders uh, and maybe one other category, like pro, quote unquote, pump supplements have to be some of the most popular. Um, and what they're, uh, you know, what they're what they're talking about is how how great this pump is for muscle growth. Really, it just makes you feel good, like you said. People like it. And do they actually increase the pump? Or here's my here's what I always say. And I know more blood flow. They'll say might give you a better pump. But um, I wonder if it's the fact that somebody drank a big glass of water with pre workout in it before the workout. You know Which what I mean? Probably got sodium in it too, right? Some of it. Yeah. But it's just another glass of water and or a big, tw- you know, sixteen ounces of whatever yeah, yeah. before they work out. Like, uh, I mean, play with that for anybody watching, listening right now. Like, play with literally getting very well hydrated, adding some sodium, um, having some carbs, and then wa- well, I I figured this out during you prep. you got it down to a number. Yeah, yeah, like it was a half a gallon of water and about seventy grams of carbohydrates, and it would there was no supplement, nothing, no, hmm. nothing yeah. that would give my give me a better pump in the gym than that in itself just doing that I'd I what I didn't track that I knew no was happening because uh, I was eating like a steak for breakfast is high sodium and cholesterol yeah, probably yeah, too yeah, which yeah. might have benefited uh, that feeling also but no doubt food food water um, and salt were like the biggest things totally uh, over any supplement totally. that was out there today's giveaway is maps aesthetic to enter to win leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it Subscribe to this channel and also turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, this month's sale, MAPS Split is half off, and the Sexy Athlete Bundle of Programs is also half off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. All right, so uh, we'll take a left here. I read a very uh, interesting article on oxytocin and dads and oxytocin and moms. Hmm. This is really interesting. So oxytocin is the bonding Bonding hormone, right? Like it's released when you're bonding and connecting uh, with people. And so in this article, it talked about how what gives children uh, a peak of oxytocin when they're with dads versus what gives them a peak of oxytocin when they're with moms. Ooh, guesses? I I mean, I think you'll probably guess right, but what do you think it is with moms and dads? Because it's different for both. So there's one thing that dads do that gives a child peak peak oxytocin. So I'm gonna guess with and one thing that moms do. I'm gonna guess with dads, it's wrestling and play, right? So okay. like wrestling with mm, re- right. wrestling with your kids, with moms maybe consoling them when they're hurt or consoling them when they're sick. Yeah, you're right. Oh really? Yeah, okay. yeah. Nurturing with moms. So if a dad nurtures, tumble, yeah. If a dad nurtures, they see oxytocin go up too. By the way, if a mom plays with a kid, but the peak that a child experiences with their dad is through play. Yeah. It's actually through play. They bond yeah. most yeah, yeah, or best with dads through play and they bond best with moms through through nurturing. Mm-hmm. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens to be the things we're better at, right? Like, yeah. Uh, I was talking my mom. We're my, wired for that. I was talking to my wife about this and she's like, I wish I could just play with the kids like you do, like as well as you do. Right. Because like we were, we were I was taking a shower with the kids and uh, sometimes my kids don't want to get in there. So I think of ways to get them having fun, right? So I took little figurines and I put them on the, we have like this little step in the shower and I put them up and I <clears> told my son, like, you could spray them down with the, you know, with the, with the, with the water or whatever. He's like, oh my God, I'm so excited. Like, I would have never thought of that. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you're not a dad. There's very, there's, <laughs> there's very few things I can say I do better with my kid than my own wife does. That's like one of them. That's it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. Like, she pretty much wins at everything else when it comes to raising the kid, but it's like, yeah, I uh, can wear them out. Play yeah, and voices. Easy. She can't do. Why, hey, wait, hey, oh, she can't. Yeah. She why can't, can't, can't they do? Listen, why can't moms do voices and sound it's, effects? It's, it's, <laughs> hey, well, even reading stories, it's like she she very much like has a cadence of how she reads the kids' a story, and they like it sometimes. But then you know, I remember you even br- bringing this up. Like I would always like make my own 
different characters and like it just go way off the map in terms of like what where the story was going and that's what they wanted every time it's like do the funny ridiculous voice yes. you know and like she was like you ruined it for me reading yeah <laughs> that's like, what Katrina says that. too Katrina yeah. gets so frustrated she's just like and then I love too when I come walking down the hall I can hear her trying <laughs> <laughs> she's trying to do the voice yeah. <laughs> trying to make, do the sound of the cop car or do this, the screeching like, tires what the robot was, say again like, you know, like, what are you doing in there <laughs> yeah. wait, wait, wait. do you ever hear your wife try to make a like explosion explosion sounds yeah. like that? Yeah. oh my god terrible it's the best. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> It's like, beep, beep, beep. Yeah, like, that's yeah. a terrible explosion. <laughs> that's not blowing anything up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good. Well, like, Max's thing size. right now is uh, make it funny, Dad. He wants me to make yeah. everything funny. Yeah, make everything funny, and it's just like, and some books it, it works really well. Some it doesn't yeah. work. Like it's a, it's like a sad story or like a like a story that has like a moral to it or something like that. And he's like wanting me to make it funny. And I'm like, ah, Dad's struggling right now. Here's a hack with little kids. If it's, it has to do if you add poop or butts or something, uh, bro, they'll laugh. Dad, or butts. Farts, yeah. It's butts. Yeah. So literally, I can oh, take a butts. story. It's always funny for little. kids. I can yeah. take a story like in uh, what is this thing right now? What is the term he used? He got it from his friend Hunter. Uh, what is it? Uh, but something, but he says all the time. And it just, he thinks that he thinks everything is that. And he says that after everything. <laughs> and so if I just tack that on to the end of the sentence in the book, it's like, <sighs> It's so funny. Now, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, <laughs> no sense, buddy, but okay. It's like, my, my, uh, my daughter started doing this thing where <clears throat> if my, if my three-year-old gets hurt or does something and gets consoling, so like he'll fall, oh, you know, and then my wife will go over and help him. My daughter, my one-year-old will see what happened and then she'll walk over and mimic what happened and act like she got hurt. So she'll see him. He'll fall. Ah, you know, and she'll walk over yeah. and fall down. Ah. I'm like, oh, what do I do with that? You know, do I console her or do I call her out? Like, yeah. Yeah. full of crap. Do the wrestling thing too. It's funny because like sometimes Courtney gets a wild hair and she's just like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take you down. And then she'll like start wrestling with the boys. And I'm like, Your looking at him like, dude. I'm like you be you be gentle with mom. <laughs> I'm Let coming her after you. Let dude. her yeah, win. They're like, yeah, and then, then they kind of like back off. You know? <laughs> well, they're getting bigger. Dude. Yeah. They can kick well, Ethan can soon. finally now sort of like uh, hold his own with her. But Courtney's funny, dude. She's scrappy. She's really scrappy. Well, she's like, an athlete. Yeah. So she still oh, yeah, got she's strong. Yeah, so she's, she's like, you know, she used to be able to pin them both and and do a pretty decent job with that but now they're like both really strong. I was going to say that's going to be an interesting that she's probably coming it's probably coming close where Ethan could no, he probably can't take her yet right yeah. he can't take her he yet. He can give her a good fight he, though probably. Yeah he I mean he can get he's out of any too. kind of uh, yeah, uh, pin that she, she has She still on got now. him on weight though I, I think she's got some size on him. Yeah, yeah. she still got him she still got him a little bit so. But he's yeah he's he's at that point now where he could do something and like you know so yeah that's, that's always kind of the funny like she's not she's not me like we have to you know sort of like do this whole thing a little differently you know and it's like they're figuring that out like because they were going full blast you know like for a while I katrina remember. doesn't even mess she get her hurt first like, that. over That's all, all the rest of oh yeah if max even i'm not your dad <laughs> yeah you do that with your dad you don't do that with me <laughs> yeah i remember when i went so when i was a kid i was brought up old school right so if you get you know get in trouble mom use the wooden spoon or whatever on you yeah. and i remember i was probably Maybe it's right around 13, 14, right? Where you start to you start to get stronger as a, as a boy, right? And I remember, I don't remember what happened. I got in trouble and my mom came over to hit me with a wooden spoon and I grabbed her arms. Oh God. And she couldn't release herself. She mm -hmm. was like, you know? Yeah. And then she yelled for my dad. So I said, I let go. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't let dad walk around the corner. Yeah. See I that. don't want to deal with that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when I started resorting to punching holes in walls. And then it's like, oh, man, now, now, I, gotta, gotta now I gotta fix it. Did yeah. you get in trouble? Would you get like big time trouble for doing that? Of course. I wouldn't dare. Oh, I wouldn't dare. My dad would my murder me. I mean, I told you guys, like, my one biggest faux pas was like, we got in because my mom and I used to battle sometimes, and like I just got so mad, I flipped her off like in her face. Oh, oh right? wow, that's a big my deal, dad bro. Grabs me, <laughs> and like that's the one time where I like you know launched off the ground into a wall, and mm. he's just like, You don't ever, you know, like it was scary, and it was like I totally justified. <laughs> Did he make you fix the wall afterwards? Oh, I was just there, just like shivering, you know, like, oh my <laughs> no. god, I fucked up. Do not do that tomorrow, don't do that. That'll protect yeah. mom, every you single time. Uh, Talking about kids and raising kids and stuff, uh, 
and I think I heard you listening to the video. I had it in my notes, and right before we got on, I thought I heard you. It was on Rob uh, Rob Wolf's page. Is that where you saw that? I don't know if it was on his. Page. Yeah, it was on. I'm was it the one about the Japanese? Yeah, uh, yeah. Obesity? I thought that was really interesting. So I tell didn't me know, about what because I, I don't watch it. Okay, so the the stats is uh, four point only four point five percent of Japanese population is obese. Mm. Four point five. Great Britain, I think, was like twenty something. And then U.S. is like forty something. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And and the the point of the article because obviously there's different. It was uh, these countries are prosper that have been prosperous over the last few decades. Oh yeah. So what you tend to see is yes. prosperity goes up, so does obesity. That's right. And okay. so that was like the whole point of the the study is that uh, of all the countries that have uh, grown more prosperous. The obesity has dramatically increased in parallel to it, mm -hmm. except for in Japan. Japan, it's only 4.5%. That's got to be one of the lowest out of modern nations. Yes, I think it is the lowest. I think it's super Did they low. say why? So he brings up in the, that interview that they just teach their kids at a very young age. So I guess he was telling a personal story of being at some of the schools in Japan and asking the kids, like, oh, what are your favorite foods? And one kid was like, broccoli. You know, and another kid like said some fruit. Another kid said white rice. And he said to the teachers, like, are these kids trolling me? Or like, do they, is this really? And she's like, no, do, uh, do you not teach your kids that healthy foods uh, are good for them and they, and to like them? And, and he's like, no, I thought they were totally messing with me. And so they just, they make that part of the education system is educating them on healthy foods and why they should eat this way. You know, I'd and, love Doug's opinion mm -hmm. on this because you, you lived there. Mm -hmm. So you were a part of the culture now and for, teaching. Now my experience, too. and so I'd love your, your opinion, your comment on this, Doug. And my, I don't, I've never been to Japan, never lived, but I, but <clears throat> through the judo school that I used to go to here in San Jose was taught by like Japanese judo instructors. And they would oftentimes teach us, uh, you know, some of the culture. And I remember they would say something like, I don't know if this is true, that it's a part of the culture to, you don't eat when you're full. You eat until you're 80% or something like that. It's like yeah, a, they it's, say uh, hara hachibu, oh, which okay. is 80%. And that's full, part of the culture. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, I know, especially down in Okinawa, that it's part of the culture down there. But overall in Japan, uh, for one, portion sizes are much smaller and this stat has to be correct because I noticed last time I was there that people are just downright thin, like wow. super thin. Wow. The average Japanese person doesn't have a lot of meat on their bones. <clears throat> um, so they they walk a lot. They have small portion sizes. I think the average person probably doesn't eat a lot of fast food, even though there is fast food around. Yeah. I just I just feel like the, the whole culture is got a different mindset. And I'm sure food. it starts from childhood, right? Oh, of I course. Mean, I mean, yeah. that's our, they don't have mountain. Our dew. celebratory meals, uh, is it celebrated to eat a lot or has it always been like when you go to like a celebration, is it like all about like tons of food? Oh yeah. In Japan, the food is massive quantities. Also. And oftentimes they're like, eat more, eat more, eat okay. more. I've been stuffed so many times over there. Okay. However, I don't think that's the normal thing. Yeah. Uh, so when they do celebrate, they do have a lot of food. Um, but yeah, I, I just feel like the Japanese, they the, the culture is just around, you know, more moderation. Well, you mm. just explained that they have a saying 80%. And one of the things that's the opposite of what we do here is how many of you grew up in a home where your parents said, finish Supersize your plate. It. Yeah. yeah, Finish your plate. <laughs> yeah. You're not leaving till you finish your or, plate. Or do you have room for more? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I remember that was one of the conversations that Katrina and I said, or we had when Max was growing, getting, uh, you know, to the point where he was feeding himself. And uh, I would say, don't, uh, if he doesn't finish his plate, he doesn't finish his plate. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it's, you know, he'll, trust me, he'll get hungry you know, <laughs> <hard> <laughs> eventually. And the rule is just that this is your dinner. We're not eating any snacks later tonight or anything like that. So if you're, if you're full, you don't want any more. This is all we're going to eat tonight, son. So I, I, are you okay? And then if he agrees, then he agrees. And then, you know, when he's eight o'clock at night, when he's like, I want a snack still or some of that, it, well, son, tomorrow when we have dinner, you got to make sure you eat, eat, eat your full plate, you know? You know, it's hilarious. I brought Japanese people over to this country and we went to places like, you know, Claim Jumper or someplace like that. Yeah. And they would get their meals. And it was like, is this for everybody? <laughs> <laughs> no, you ordered that. That's yours. Okay. Yeah. And then another thing is when they eat like cookies or cakes here, they always comment how sweet they are. Because yeah. oh, in yeah. Japan, you go get a cake or a cookie and it's much less sweet than it is here. I yeah. told you guys that, that that's like the coolest thing right now to watch. And we just were down another example. We're down in Universal Studios, right? Okay. Now I'm now at Max is five. We are now at a place where I don't police the food. And I, in fact, when we are at places like that, I, I'm the one who picked up cotton candy and like, hey, do you want some? Like he literally 
like one or two bites and it's like enough. It's so, it's so overwhelming yeah. that him sharing a lick of my ice cream or a bite of the cotton candy is enough for him that he doesn't even, I want more. I want my own. It's just like, I could literally just give him a bite and be like, that's all you get. And he's okay wow. with it. And I think so much of that has to do with those first three or four years of being really disciplined about whole foods, lots of vegetables, lots of fruit, any, anything that we had that worked, it's like granola was like a treat to him. Culture is very important when it comes to, um, obesity. Um, like for example, Italy, now Italians, the culture is you eat and you enjoy your food. However, they also have a culture around food quality and tradition. So when you compare Italy's obesity rise and rate to other, Western nations, it actually is lower. It's actually lower than other countries, but it's not because Italians don't overeat because God knows we do. It's because of the culture around the food itself where it's like, no, 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 this is quality. And no, no, this has to come from this region or whatever. But you know how hard it was for me to break that pattern of not getting my kids to finish their plate? Uh, it felt like I didn't love them. That was a feeling right. I got when they would leave their plate. No, I have to make you eat everything. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if I don't, I'm not taking care of you. It was very hard very hard to break. Oh, and good. not only that, but pe other people will make you feel guilty like you're starving your kid or something like that. It's like, dude, you, he he ate lunch and breakfast. If he has a half a dinner and goes to bed, I'm not depriving my child. He's not going- When I was a kid- He's not fasted. When I was a kid, my grandma would follow us around with a plate of food. Yeah. Like follow yeah, us while we're that. playing. I'm trying to feel And would just give it to us in between, you know, us playing with things. So we're like- And is that more- Mindlessly- Do you eating? think that's more Italian culture or do you think that's more like Great Depression time because yeah. of that? I think it's all part of it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's all a lot of the Great Depression stuff. It, it like goes generational. So yeah. like my grandma was like huge on that stuff, and then my mom, as a result, kind of like adopted a lot of these <clears> things. It's like I found out too. I didn't even know this. Like my aunt, uh, uh, when I was in Minnesota too. Like it was funny because we were kind of just talking about we were eating, and then I didn't want to eat too much because they have a big family, and it's always like you don't want to be the guy going in and getting your normal portion, and then like leaving because I didn't know if they had enough food. Uh, but, uh, it was like, there was leftovers, but I didn't realize like something she does consistently that also like one of my cousins does just as a habit that's like passed on is like, you know, whatever is left over, they like put it all together as their plate and then they eat everybody's leftovers. Yeah. And I was just like, that's the culture, yeah. God, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's like, I get it. Like I get like the mentality of that, but then you're just like. Oh, like those are different times. You know, that's definitely a, a save and conserve mentality. Yeah. Well, 4.5 is crazy that's low. That's very low. That's crazy low. Yeah, I know. I mean, you, that- You know, they also have a culture of exercise. They have a culture of uh, people do movement and Before activity. work and stuff. Before, even jobs will have employees yes. do this. Some yeah, companies- yeah. Um, or just the culture of uh, a nice walk after eating. Now, were you a part of that when you were there? Did they, did, would they have like a school warm-up thing? Or? Yeah, we did a lot of calisthenics and things at the school. You did? Yep. Oh, and then wow. every year there was this big thing they call sports day that we would do. And the kids would prepare for it for quite a while, all kinds of sports type activities. And so there was a real culture around doing uh, physical activity. Wow. Yeah, I saw another clip. I don't remember. And I th I wanted, I think it was Japan also. And they were showing like a, you know, classroom. And these kids were, I want to say between the ages of like five and eight, really young. And they were showing this like, uh, almost like a, um, what's that called? Uh, parkour type of mm -hmm. setup. Oh, you showed me. Yeah. And the kids were just doing. They were crazy. Like yeah. What they could do. All of them. The whole, yeah. the mm -hmm. whole class was, yeah. was going through this like obstacle course. I'm like, oh my God, like. I don't think my my son can do you, half of that. You know, stuff. this reminds me of how valuable it is, if possible, uh, to go to different cultures and see what yeah. is different and valuable. Sure, because you get so caught up in your own culture. Because uh, I mean, there's things in all cultures that I think are good and bad. So it's so ignorant of us to think that we have it all figured out the best. No, <laughs> that's like the most ignorant thing ever no. to be like, yo, we have it all. We we figured it out the best, and we do it. No, <laughs> like the like the, like in like some Japanese speaking of Japanese culture, the way that they treat their elderly is is incredible. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. And the elderly really don't suffer like they do in other countries because it's part of the culture. Take care of uh, you know your your elderly. Yeah, yeah. Really, right. really good stuff. Anyway, so did you know? So. Organifi's Pure comes in this bag now. You commented on the fact that it says digestion. Yeah. I, I'll, uh, let me let me talk about yeah, that. I don't remember second. reading that on there. So Pure is supposed to, well, it's, it's designed to help with cognitive function. The reason why they include components that help with digestion is because Organifi understands the gut-brain access. That's one of the brilliant things about this product. 
if your digestion is off, for sure your cognitive function is going to be altered. And we know this because of the communication highway between the two is very connected. So what they put in here are compounds that help with digestion as well. So good gut health is good brain health. That's what a lot of people don't. Interesting. Don't, yeah, don't realize. I don't. D does anybody else do that? That's kind of like you would think that would be uh, almost standard than in e like any nootropic that's out there or any of these supplements that it's no, supposed to. No, ninety nine percent of the nootropics I see out there are all about uh, being like more like a stimulant. Mm -hmm. I don't know to why. Make you feel more. I don't even know why I never thought of that, Sal. That like you know you take this nootropic for better cognitive function, but then your gut health is all off. Right. It's like. What are you really doing? It's like you're plugging one hole and you got all these other You leaks. should look at the studies on gut health and anxiety, depression, and the connection between gut brain, your access. microbiome and dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all kinds of different uh, you know, disorders of central nervous system. Interesting. But yeah, so they put compounds in that help with brain function, but also stuff that helps with uh, the I digestion. didn't know that. I literally saw the digestion smart. thing. That's so weird. Like, yeah. like what, why that? Yeah. I, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Organifi Spe for the win. I know. They do a good job. Speaking of the mind and stuff like that, I got, you know, it's funny, you know, we talk about this on the show, but then experiencing it uh, myself again, I've done this many times, but always experiencing it always reminds me of how challenging cer certain aspects of training and nutrition are. And it's all mental. It's always all mental. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're somebody, that, uh, you know, let's say you've, you've done a good job, you're fit and healthy, but maybe when you grew up, you were overweight and then you hear us say, Hey, you should go on a bulk. Sometimes you should add calories. You should try to maybe reverse diet. The mental challenge of that is so hard. And then on the flip for someone like me growing up skinny and always wanting to be big or whatever, when I try to cut my, my intake to reduce, let's say body fat or whatever, the mental challenge is, even though I know it's better for me. The mental challenge is like always like just to see the scale go down a little bit, yeah. feel like in the gym, a little bit less of the, you know, the, the feeling you get from more calories. I'm like today I was happy today. I was working out. I'm like, man, that mental part, you never, you, you always have to deal it's with it. It's always there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think so many people go through their fitness journey, not even realizing that and just justifying, oh, because I'm doing exercise, I'm doing these things. I'm okay. It's like, I mean, we had a caller not that long ago that we, we were talking about this and I was just. Uh, expressing how important I think it is that you're you're always trying to figure that out. In my experience, most everybody that becomes infatuated with the gym and is very very consistent with it has some deep rooted insecurities around body nutrition and something. And if you don't attempt to address that or kind of it, it's just it's always like just yeah. below the surface there. And it is and whether you know it or not, it's subconsciously driving a lot of your behaviors. And many times those behaviors can move you away from optimal health. And so always trying to find ways to challenge those insecurities. First, figure them out, right? Because I think that's step one. I think a lot of people ignore or don't realize it or deny. And then, okay, accepting like, okay, I come from being the skinny and secure kid. I want to be muscular. Therefore, what are probably things that are going to drive me to go the other direction? And what are things I can do within my fitness journey that will challenge that uh, is only going to force growth in you and make you a healthier version of yourself. Yeah. Uh, but it's a practice that I don't feel like it's communicated. It's in good our to space be room. aware of because it's like you get that, like that, like you know, I'll do the the typical or the stereotypical female <clears throat> client, you know, dieted on and off over and over again, many many times. Comes to you and you look at her nutrition. And you go, okay, we need to reverse diet. You got to build your metabolism, build some muscle. So they do. What happens in that first few weeks, right? muscles fill up with some glycogen. They feel a little tighter. Oh my God, the scale went up a pound or two. Panic mode, right. panic mode. Oh Which my God. Which is like the opposite for a dude. It's like, oh yeah, I feel yeah. like big yeah. again. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I know. You know, how long, how long, Adam, how long did it take you to go on your first like proper cut? Oh, I, it wasn't until I competed. That was, and it was only, this is what's crazy, Sal, is that I probably wouldn't have broke through that insecurity fully had I not, uh, publicly committed to getting on stage, oh, wow. and what I knew because I re I remember this this moment of time when I had came out and said I'm going to do a show. Right, I put it on Instagram, and I was at that time we were this is before Mind Pump really, and I was trying to grow the Instagram. And I, I knew that once I said that publicly, it was so important that I followed through on what I said. That I knew, okay, I've never competed before. I don't know what I'm doing. I know I've been lifting weights for long enough that I have muscle, so I just need to get as shredded as possible. 
who cares if I do it right or anything like that. It's just, I gotta get shredded. And so I had to accept that like, I'm probably gonna lose a bunch of muscle and I'm losing all this muscle, right? Just gotta get shredded. What I can't do is get on stage and be, have a high body fat percentage. I knew that. And so I was so fully committed to that direction that if I hadn't done that, uh, I don't know if I would have made it through. I, I think I would have probably stopped be, because of my insecurities around feeling like the small guy and yeah. all and stuff like that. And then watching myself really be depleted and dwindled down like that and going like, Oh my God, I'm, this is getting terrible. I'm losing all kinds of muscle. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. That was going through my head, but I was like, it doesn't matter. I committed to getting on stage and I can't get on stage fat. I can you gotta be shredded. So I, I just kept going. And I think when I got all the way to the other side and it helped getting like compliments from people telling me like, Oh my God, what are you doing? You're jacked. And I'm going like, what? Jacked? I lost all kinds of muscle lately. Like, how could people think that? It's like, oh my God, like, that's my own, that's that my weird? own, my own shit. Yeah. It's not really what's going on. Like, really what's going on is I lost a lot of body fat. Maybe I lost a couple pounds of muscle, but not a lot. Not yeah. as much as my, what my brain was not telling Not what you're me. feeling or thinking. Yeah. yeah. So that was a really pivotal point for me in my journey was recognizing how powerful that insecurity was because at that time too, if you were to have asked me in real time, I would have been like, I'm fine. Yes. Yeah, I would have I told you I, I'm not insecure about it. I'm aware of it. I know that's why I got into lifting weights. I'm fine. I wouldn't think nothing of it. I mean, the newest one that I'm still like in right now that I thought was really interesting was my portion control. And I told you when I went through the whole GLP one thing, you know, I had this kind of epiphany of wait a second, like, maybe I've been stressing myself to be big by eating so much and training this way for so long that that's a lot of where this, this gut stress is coming from that's causing this autoimmune issue. And just because it's been, you know, it's two chicken breast or it's, uh, you know, a pound of steak and white rice and broccoli, I'm justifying it because it's healthy, but it's like, maybe I'm really stressing my digestive system to try and be a bigger version than my body really wants it to be. And so I'm in that right now. I mean, I just had a night last night where, you know, tacos are one of my favorite dishes. Is it a different feeling? Like, or were you so used to feeling a particular way after a meal? That, yeah. Like, that's how I'm supposed to feel. Yeah. So, like, for example, like I was going to share, like last night, tacos is one of my favorite uh, dishes that Katrina makes. Um, and, and we do like ground turkey and you know, it's a little bit of cheese in there and lettuce and tomatoes and some salsa. That's kind of like what our tacos look like, right? And uh, I can eat 10 of those. I mean, that's like traditionally like Katrina will always, where she's preparing, she's like, you want your usual 10, mm. you know, or, and a light day would be eight. I had four last night. And when I was done, I was totally fine and satisfied. That you could have gone 10. But I could have eaten yeah. 10 yeah, yeah. because I've trained myself to eat like that, to be this yeah. big 240 jacked dude. I've got to eat 10 tacos. Like I need the calories. But, you know, to be a smaller version of myself uh, and still be healthy and fun, like I, so it's really still, I'm going through it right now. It's a very interesting you know what's crazy part of my journey. You just reminded me of this client I had years ago, this young lady who came out of an eating disorder. And I remember her saying something like what you just said, except the opposite. She said, it's weird not feeling hungry all the time. She was so used to that feeling yeah. that that's what was normal to her. Yeah. That when she came out of it, she was, it was uncomfortable. Because she had trained herself during the eating disorder to just feel hungry all the time, gotten comfortable with it. Yes. That's what I'm supposed to feel. I think I really have trained myself to eat beyond being full. And whatever that feeling that is, yeah, is it becomes I, your normal. I've normalized it so much that I've I've blunted the satiety signal of, oh, you're fine, Adam. You don't need any more. And it's and it's a, a major mental hurdle. It's yeah. a mental hurdle to go, oh, I'm gonna eat half of what I normally would. Then I'm just going to sit in it a minute and then really, truly ask myself, are you still hungry or are you okay? Now, I got to imagine for you, Justin, on the other side of this, that that challenge must have come from your training. Mm. Like, it probably took you a long time to be like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to feel like after a workout, not like I'm dead. What do you mean? Like, your intensity. When you were training for football and stuff like that, I'm imagining yeah. that you got used to a particular intensity. Oh, and it probably took you a while to figure out. In terms of old habit, yeah. that's like a really hard to shake. Yeah, that would probably fit under yeah, super hard because, uh, again, it's the discipline of of being able to overcome the obstacles. And, you know, that was stressed to us more than anything was like you have to be able to mentally bear the pain and, and you have to like – uh, crush every single workout and you have to crush every single practice. You have to be first in every sprint. You know, it, it was like, 
you're just constantly picking apart everybody else around you and trying to, to do more than everybody else. So it's like doing more and also doing more intense and, and more load was like everything. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's still there, it, you know, as you guys kind of go through like uh, what, 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 you know, stops you. Like that's one that's always reoccurring for me is when I'm training, I'm like, uh, calm down, especially if I'm in a setting where I'm at the gym this is why I don't really, I think I've, I've done a lot better training on my own at, at my house. Do you get competitive? That- yeah. And I don't even realize I'm doing it. <laughs> no. You know, it's like, you're just, you know, doing your thing. And then somebody pops up next to you and is, is squatting right next to you. And I'm just like looking out and I'll, yeah. I'll stack. Today was supposed to be a light there. day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, ah, I can't, and, and, ah, I just can't help it. Like I, I, I'm just like, triggered to do that speaking of the gym you know do you guys have like favorite types of people that work out in the gym like for me like if i see older people working out or kids like young younger kids like you know like 15 16 i love seeing that i love seeing like doing things right you know well yeah especially if you have good form and and, dude the the other day i was working out trying really hard and at the rack next to me was a kid he must have been maybe 18 19 younger guy and he was like good technique, squatting mm-hmm. and lifting. And so I felt like, all right, let me, let me give him a fist bump. And I'm like, Dude, sure. how long have you been working out? He's like yeah. a year. Like your squats look really good. And I, then of course I give him advice because I'm an asshole. Oh, I so think, like, I think. <laughs> you need a better weight belt. I think <laughs> seeing a woman squat or deadlift heavy weight with good form is like one of the coolest that's things. That's also pretty yeah. Yeah, when I, when, see. Do you see me, that a lot now, dude? Well, that's why it's kind of cool because I was, I've been, I was there before and I'm, I'm yeah. here now, right? And it's been a really neat journey to watch gym cultures completely shift and change to where that has become normal where that was so foreign it was foreign to see anybody squatting or deadlifting but yeah. it, you would still see the occasional strong guy come yeah. in there or power and lift and do those those movements so to see uh, a woman do it and not just do it to like just do the movement but to do it with good technique yeah. and good load and like really challenge is really cool Dude. You know, my yeah. first, uh, my first district manager at 24 hour fitness was Simon. I don't remember his last name. Simon. Big dude. You never met him because he left. Well, w- say, right, yeah. When he, he left, say that. Doesn't ring a bell. And he was a strongman competitor from the UK. And I, that was my first time I'd ever see somebody really lift like crazy weight. I remember I was in the front. He had come in to do like an audit and not an audit, but just kind of visit whatever. And, uh, I hear in the back in the weight room, I hear, Kush, Kush. And then one of my trainers was like, Simon squatting. So I'm like, oh shit, I gotta see this. <laughs> was he and, a big dude? Bro, he was, I mean, he was a strongman competitor. Yeah. So he had, I don't remember how many plates was on there, six plates or something like that. Oh, wow. Squatting. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was so the that's first time make I make some noise. Yeah, yeah, dude. And I was like, and he got a lot of respect just because he was so, you know, by the staff, just because he was such a big, he didn't really give us much advice though. This is what he would, he would always call us. <laughs> but, yeah, are, you, are we popping? All right, let's get popping. Put up some balloons. I was like his favorite. <laughs> Put up some balloons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was his favorite piece of advice. Uh, well, I've for, never heard uh, yeah, that reference. Yeah. 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 Anyways, it's it's yeah. It's so funny. Yeah, it was you a good know, time. The hardest thing about being someone like that, you know, I know one of our uh, one of our partners today, right? We have State Liberty today is thinking about- like, Oh, I got a message. I got a message from somebody. Oh, really? Yeah, so big dude, right? Lifts weights, built or whatever. He's like, I got us, and he posted, he goes, I, got a, I bought a suit off the rack. Yeah, and I, I wear it. And it's that was the point I was just gonna make because you were bringing up big jack dudes and stuff like that. It's like, th- like Ugh. I love that they decided that we're gonna build this business. We are not gonna try and cater to everybody. Yeah, we see a, a, a mm-hmm. huge, There's a huge deficit that is. needs There's, to be addressed. There There's a, a major demand in this yeah. market of fit, athletic people that don't have clothes that are fit for them yeah. that just aren't small waist broad shoulders like good size in the arms like and quads. you work out always get the parachute sort of yes. effect you know if you got any kind of broad shoulders yes. or big upper body i mean the founder was an ex nhl guy right so big athletic yeah. build and that was his he because like i could never and going to professional games without they getting suits and things like that their gets, shirts too it's not just yes. suits their shirts uh, all their clothes yeah, everything. this is my favorite t-shirt they just out said, of all things you know that mm-hmm. they make because it totally just forms they just it's sent nice. us a sick uh, shirt their new uh flannel or not flannel thermal like hoodie yeah. but i haven't been able to put it on because we just had a crazy heat wave <laughs> yeah, like they we j- he Dude's just sent me a hot. box he's oh, like hey man. i got some stuff for you guys i'm gonna send it over it's like a this uh, new shirt that they have i don't know if you know the you know name I, of it, Doug. I, I predict a female market growing for something like that you know that because you're getting more and more women who are strength well, training well, is it like bigger legs wouldn't you say that like was what thighs. what exploded lululemon I mean, I mean it's because it's spandex it kind of fits anybody or whatever not yeah. spandex but you know tight but 
you know, you tell a woman that lifts, ask her what it's like buying jeans. Jeans ask, is, is a especially huge. Especially jeans. Yeah. Or even Missed shirts, you know, because, yeah. you, you know, if, if you have any kind of muscle on your body, you don't have to be a bodybuilder. So any kind of muscle, you go put on some traditional, you yeah. know, women's clothing yeah. and you're like, nothing fits. If it doesn't yeah. fit, if it fits my butt, doesn't fit my waist or it's tight around my legs or it's tight around the shoulders. So I predict that there's going to be a female market because more women are lifting weights. Than yeah, ever. there's a lot of like small like startup I brands I know that are out there that are trying to uh, attract uh, that that demographic. Because I mean, we're I guess 20 years ago there wasn't a big enough need to make the you know it, there wasn't a big enough need and ability to reach people everywhere like that. Yeah. That's the only reason why it works now is that- Yeah, you're we, right. Because if it if didn't have the internet- Yes. Yes. Because yeah. fitness has grown now. If you were a, if you were a, uh, I, Lululemon is not a good example because of the Spanx that you said, but like if you were a brand like that, State and Liberty or like, oh, that's the waffle knit hoodie. I think sick. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, can't yeah. wait to wear it. It's yeah. freaking it's 90, 98 degrees out right <laughs> yeah. now. So not right now. Shout out to the guys. I haven't had a chance to wear mine, but I did try it on and it fits awesome. So I can't wait to wear it. I'm not wearing it right now though, for sure. But anyways, it, the if you if you had a brand like that, brick and mortar, twenty years ago, probably really hard to scale. Oh, yeah. I mean, because then you would attract a very small percentage of people yeah. that unless have, you see it like visibly a lot, like in your town, like which you won't, because right. yeah, there's no way that you get foot traffic. Well, I mean, back to our last stat, how we started this: forty something percent of people obese, yeah. so they're not fitting in clothes. Like more than half the people out there don't fit in those types of clothes so to build a business but because of the internet and because of the growth of yeah. fitness in the last decade or two at the, it can be profitable are, yeah yeah but yeah but um, stre strength training in general is trending upward for everyone but mm -hmm. more so for women far more for women I'm, 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 i've been looking at stats uh, uh on this and just kind of trends yeah and um well i mean look it at, is well, we, we've seen trendy. the crossover from yeah a lot of cardio emphasis to look now. at muscle uh, weight training which is yep. yeah it's it's biggest really launch cool we ever had that. i know i mean uh which is crazy to think that, right? To to write a program of all the programs written and say, specific to a for a, women, yeah, and say this is, that it outsold the ones that are forever. It's like yeah. that's crazy to me when you think about that. Yeah. But that h highlights your point of of the. Growth well, speaking of, of uh, big guys, like uh, so, have you seen? I don't know if you've seen this, Adam, but uh, this guy Oliver Rowe, Rowe, I don't know. It's like a, a R O I X. He's a uh, basketball player, 18 years old. Oh, yeah, yeah, I seen him. Dude, just got signed. I don't, I don't know where he's going he's, for college. I think it's somewhere it's in the East It's a prep Coast. school. He's in a prep school down uh, Southern California. It's the real popular one. I can't think Dude, of Dude, he's 7'9". Yeah, they showed it. They showed what? a compare. They put he a can, comparison. Like, just put the ball in, like, yeah. standing. At 18? Big, tall, yes. white boy. They compared him That's next ridiculous. to Wimby. They put him next to Wimby at the same age when he was 18, and he has, like, a good... And stick. he's, like, filled out, too. He's yeah, not he's just, like, yeah, a not, little, like, He's not skinny figure. like Wimby. He's th he's a thicker guy, for sure. That, that guy What is, is the name of that prep school? Oh, there's a really know. popular prep school in LA. What is in the water? Where they're known is, for their though. football it's... program, and I can't think. I can't think of it right now. There's... You imagine the challenges of having a kid that big. He's huge. Yeah, because you don't fit in a bed. You don't. You, you, like, where do right you buy there. your shoes? It's I M. What is that? I M D or I M T? What is the the school? I M G. That's a big I M G. Kid. Is there a school? You're... Oh yeah, it's for uh, right. Yeah, it's a prep school. You know right. what? You're right, Justin, because you would expect an 18 year old who's seven nine to be super skinny. Oh yeah, I mean you've seen yeah, Wimby. He before. looks like proportional and filled out. You know, it's like for the most part. I mean, he's pretty. There's clumsy and lanky. But... Yeah, there's clips of him like literally like catching the ball in the post, turning around and just like <laughs> yeah, yeah, like <laughs> deep. yeah. It's hilarious. Like... Who's that standing next to him? It looks like a child. It is a child. Yeah, okay. it is a child. I mean, yeah. if this keeps happening, they're gonna sense. have to raise the hoop. I would. Oh, Oh, God, assume, yeah. dude. It's oh, like, God. dude, he's so big. I mean, I haven't watched enough of his play, although I, I think they're 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 touting him as well, like the next big big draft pick. You right? do see some challenges in his movement for yeah. sure because well, he's, he's, he's you know yeah exactly and, he looks a, l a little bit like a baby draft, but you know it's if he gets more athletic, stronger, like man, he's gonna be a dominating. Player. So this is what made Wimby so crazy, right? Was that he actually can handle the ball, he can pass, he can. Sh I mean, he's draining threes. Yeah, he's. he's like, athletic and he, skillful. Now, who yes, was it like that, that went? There's been a lot of tall guys. Who yeah. was it that went to the NBA right out of high school? Wasn't it? Oh, there's uh, a lot of players that did. Garnett oh, went LeBron. out of there. Kobe went out yeah. of there. LeBron went out of there. There's There's been a lot of oh, okay. guys at, at this Carmelo, point. Carmelo. But right. they, they they changed that rule. Now you have to play one year of college. You have to. You have to. Yeah. So. Do you know why they changed that rule? <sighs> there is a reason and I don't know off the top of my head. I can't remember why. 
I'm, I'm, it's what a what a blessing and a curse just to be 18 because you don't know anything when you're that old uh and to be 18 and then to get famous and rich all at once blessing and a curse more of a curse in my opinion could mm -hmm. you imagine if yeah. if you guys got that sounds crazy rich i know that sounds crazy to say that but i really you're right i i really I agree with you i really think that yeah. Uh, Imagine unless if you have really good parents that have structure laid out like yeah. alongside and that. And you still, still follow them. Crazy. Because you're 18, you're technically an adult. Imagine being uh, 18 and suddenly becoming rich and famous. How messed up would you guys have been? Uh, I would have been. I don't oh, know if I'd be here right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be such a I really had terrible ideas back the then. The NBA established the one and done rule in 2005 to prepare athletes for the physical and mental demands of professional level. Oh, uh, uh, just probably for them to, to be more mature. A little just bit. So they're a little more mature. Okay. Yeah. Th that or that's it's that's the cover story and it's really some political yeah, it's, financial it's reason some probably. kind of that's probably, probably the, right the some truth is probably more political i and think it's more from the colleges sort of uh you know well you know now that too there. that they, these these kids now can take endorsements and stuff so you're yeah. gonna, you're seeing these kids uh, at the yeah. high school level getting we'll scouted still make money and, yeah and, wow. and getting paid early dude i gotta tell you guys about a stat that i learned the other day we're talking about kids and stuff this is real i confirm this did you know that after major wars, after major wars happen, more boys are born. Did you know that? And they're trying. They try. There's studies There's trying to higher testosterone wow. levels or something like that. The increase of that or something like that. You know, like, that's not associated with with making uh, with okay. producing more male uh, offspring. This is completely unrelated. But I had a, a, a same similar kind of a conversation with my sister in law in like talking about like. Um, what's that one herb that kind of just grows like randomly? It's a uh, St. John's wort sure. or whatever. Okay. Like, so in, in terms of like, uh, viruses and things like that are in the environment, like it, I, there was some kind of like random occurrence of like a lot of these, like very specific type of herbs and things that would help to kind of oh, like remedy the connection it. between yes. Them? Like, yeah, it, like nature's before. sort of like uh, accounting bouncy, for, bouncy yes. Out. Like the virus yeah. that was there, like in terms of that being like war and like, I wonder if, you know, along those so lines. So I've heard that with plants. Like there's one plant that looks like a snake's fangs and then the extract from that plant is good to treat uh, like snake poison was like an, an example. But this is weird, right? Well, but, what, so, and I mean, they're trying to figure out. I've seen studies. I looked up the studies. Yeah. To try to figure out why or like, what it like is. Like it's a signal or something. Like so one, one of the theories uh, positioned by Japanese researcher, I think it was in 2007, said that after wars – the men that survive tend to be more physically fit and, and a little bit taller, and they tend to produce more male offspring. But then I read some critiques of that. Like, yeah. I don't know if that's so true. I think, evolutionarily speaking, there's something that we're not figuring out, but it's more of a, it's a stress. And who dies most in wars? Men. Men, men mm -hmm. die most in wars. Right, yeah. And, and so it would make sense that evolutionary speaking, it picks up the pace on producing more boys after a whole shit ton of them. Now, so weird balance. To this now, how, strange, right? now, how, how, okay. Cause the first thing that comes to my head with this is like, like how dramatic of a difference. Like, so for example, there's two, there's obviously two sexes, uh, bo boys or girls. Yeah. And so one of them is going to be more dominant than the other, right? One's going to yeah. be 51%. One's going to be 49%. Is what, what is the norm? And then what is, I forgot the what the two numbers is it were. Like really no, it, well, so it's like like look, 2 it, difference. Like, no, no, well, it's like really crazy. No, well, so when you look at 2% difference, no, no, well, it's significant chance. when you look at a generation. When you look at a generation, the percentage is big enough for it to be like, oh, wow, we had a lot more boys than we normally do. If you just look at it like on a per you know birth basis, it's a small percentage. Uh, typically, though, I believe more boys are born than girls anyway, slightly, because boys are more likely to die, if I'm not mistaken. Right, so if it's 51%, mm. let's say on the norm, 51% uh, boys, 49% girls, and then it goes to uh, 52 and 48, like, come on. Uh, that, that would make a big difference. One percent over a generation, yeah, but would be millions. But I, mean, I mean, well, I mean, consider millions of children born. You're talking about a person. Per, I don't remember what the the. But the, don't you feel like the, the, the okay? So if that's you pulling out over a generation, now pull out over a hundred years. I would imagine you would easily see it go up and down two or three percent in each direction. So, so they so call it the returning bo the returning soldier effect is what it's called. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's wild, right? Uh, huh. I'm trying to find what the percentage is. The normal ratio is 1.3 to 1.6 males to females. Sorry. So a little bit more women are born uh, to men, um, just slightly. 
but and it doesn't show what the percentage is here when, when it goes uh, afterwards. afterwards. But it is well observed. I mean, I just I, it's funny because you're you're talking about something that we're talking. It's about. just weird to me, right? Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah, it's it's an interesting. It's phenomenon. only weird to me if it's dramatic enough that it it's like, oh my god, something's going on here. But I feel like a, a percent sal difference is not, just because. Yes, I know one percent of a million people is still a lot of people, but it's still one percent. It's mm. not moving that different in a different direction. That it, it can't just be by chance. That it just oh we went on a stretch now where this has happened. So to me that's not. It's kind of like I tagged you in that uh, post mm. that Holly Baxter did, and it looked like it was a post you know, are arguing with oh, well, Jeff Nippert's that, yeah, I get what you're saying. point of view, right? And it's like- it's Partial split. reps after full range of motion reps uh, in the stretch position, build more muscle. But then we look at the data, it was like 0.05 uh, <laughs> lar- like right. centimeters so bigger. In terms of- She tagged yeah. me. I don't know why she Relevance, tagged me. Relevance, it's like- I'm it's not sure why thin. she tagged me because it was- uh, I think it was Jeff Nipper that made the, the initial piece of content. And I don't know if they wanted our opinion on it, but it's like, I just think this is so funny. That's why I don't think she, I don't think she was thinking it all the way through to tag me because this stuff annoys me. I think this is what is, this is one of the worst parts of our fitness space is that you get a bunch of fitness dorks that want to dive into the, these studies and go so granular and make arguments for their point of why it it's worthless or it does help and it's like when you pull back, it's majoring in the minors. Yeah, and and it's a it's literally the only people that it could potentially even really help are the one percent of the one percent people that are already fanatical about working out, and now they're like, oh, here's a novel stimulus yeah. I can do now to get an it's extra. Really, just discoveries they've found personally, and they, what it, they haven't even coached people. Through and most all of these. it really does is, I don't know. I think that. Our goal when we started this was let's go after the 80 something percent of people that are not working out, yeah. that are not training, that 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 we could teach them some very basic, simple things they can add in their life that could really fundamentally shift their entire entire trajectory. Yeah, to put it differently, who is this information valuable for? That you can gain 0. 0.05 centimeters more in a 12 week period adding stretched partials at the end of a completed set. And so more importantly, who's Sal, that valuable for? Yeah, yeah. that 1% of 1% I said. Yeah. And more importantly, and how, how many long. how many exactly. of the how many of the 80% people I'm talking about does that just confuse? You know why it confuses <laughs> and make them? it more difficult. You know why? Because then they see a lot of posts about it. I know. And so then it gets they get this 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 it's disproportionate information. Wow, this is important. I got to focus on this thing over here. Yes, it's like you haven't gone to the gym because well, the main for- levers just get lost in the in the fray. Yeah, you know, because it just becomes like like noise. You know, that, that you, nobody cares about. You anymore. know, what the other challenge is I think I remember when Ben Greenfield told told us this. He said he didn't. He got bored. Yes, uh, talking about That's the same stuff because bored. he didn't know how to keep talking about the same stuff. So he started getting weirder and weirder. Yeah, weirder. Going, deeper, percent, going deeper and deeper. And deeper. Yeah. To me, I could see how that would happen. Yeah. You know? To me, it highlights too a lot, of, or maybe this just permeates. This is the uh, the internet trainer culture, right? Where you haven't trained a lot of people in person, and so yes. when you when you when you're talking on to the internet and you don't actually have real people you're having to work with day in and day out. You get you start to go into these rabbit holes of information when it's like when it's really easy for me to look back at the decade of training real people and go like I'd never had any of those conversations. I never had to, we never talked about a stupid well, and it wasn't because I didn't read that study or I wasn't familiar with that information. It was just like where every person I ever trained was at in their fitness journey that mattered nothing. Yeah. Mattered nothing. Yeah. Like, so w- w- I would never communicate it. So what, so, so, but now that we're in the internet world where everybody an Instagram posting and stuff like that, now all of a sudden that's a, a permanent information. Like I don't, uh, 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 it reminds me when you're squatting and you're trying to ask the guy for like, you know, what, what's the, the biggest things I need to learn. And you're like disappointed because it was all just like, the Oh main, yeah. You know, you're looking for all those little nuanced, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, hacks and secrets. <laughs> yeah. And that's the culture we have now with, I know. with the, Huberman's and the uh, Brecca's and like all these kind of people that like they give just enough of like uh, scientific terms and things for people to be like, wow, this is like wild. And, and he knows what he's talking about. And like, it's so like laser pointed uh, to where it, it moves nothing. It yeah. does very little for you to focus on those. Things. And yeah. only the people that are fanatics like the rest of us are the ones that defend those people. It's so funny. It's like, the, yeah. what do you, 
are you talking about? This is great. This is why I follow him. It's like, yeah, you're not. Bro, I, you're I had not to sit and have one of my good friends like tell me all of these like ideas and and uh, like biohacks that he learned from, from Hubert Brecca. And I'm like, bro. dude, relax. You know, like, <laughs> like bro, put you're down, not doing hey, like put all down of the these double main cheeseburger, right? Yeah, French fries, seen, dog. Have you seen? <laughs> like, that's like a new shit for you. Have dude? you seen the new guy? I don't know who he is. So forgive me. People might know. Uh, he wears first off in all of his videos. He wears blue light blocking glasses, orange ones, which if you're already doing that all the time, I don't believe, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Sorry. That's just annoying. Yeah. You're wearing them all the time. Like yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. He's got a mustache. He used to be really overweight. Then he lost weight. Now he's like this, this like super hacker guy. I have not seen. Who oh that is. my God. Who is it? He's, Who is I don't know his name. Lane went into him. <laughs> in one post oh, my and God. Then, so i looked into this guy and i started watching him like oh gosh this guy he got himself into shape which is good good for you but now he's like an expert on uh, stuff yeah, yeah it's, dude it's really frustrating it's hopefully our editors will find him. we all post up who he is i can't, I can't believe i don't know who that is yeah. i wonder who that is that That's so, that yeah. whole hacking space is interesting that, that whole biohacking that, space that, that, anyway so uh let's uh who we give a shout out to trucky today? trucky Ooh. Trucky NCI. Stuff. Yeah, let's come see yeah. if you're a trainer or coach. Count go down. to MP, mindpumpnci.com. Yeah. Come uh, hang out with us and uh, let's do a deep dive on your business. It's uh, September 12th, 13th, and 14th up in Truckee with us. It's only be 10 people. So hopefully there's some spots available. Mindpumpnci.com. That's it. Zbiotics is a company that makes a probiotic drink that's been genetically modified. In other words, you can't find this probiotic anywhere else, it's patented. But what it's done or what they do with it is they designed it to break down acetaldehyde. This is a negative byproduct of alcohol consumption. So check it out. Here's what you do. You drink Zbiotics, then you go out drinking with your friends, and then you feel way better. And this stuff really, really works. Remarkably so. Go check it out. Go to Zbiotics.com. That's Z-B-I-O-T-I-C-S.com forward slash mind pump 24. Use the code mind pump 24 for 15% off first-time purchasers. All right, back to the show. First question is from e Lizard 10 e Should you eat fewer calories on rest days? If so, how many fewer? This is a good question because yeah. uh, physiologically, I don't think there's an answer. I think you can make arguments in either way. I think this is more of a like mental yes. behavior thing for you. Right. For me personally, uh, if I were trying to maintain a lean physique, I make sure to be more disciplined on my rest days than on my training days because the training days tend to give me more discipline anyway. So if I'm working out, my day tends to be more structured. If I'm not working out, the day tends to be loose. And if I don't place a little more focus on the discipline around the rest days, then it tends to turn into a let's eat whatever the hell I want and go nuts type of deal. Well, you have broken down studies before that support undulating calories yeah. is does have physiological benefits yes, too. Yes, 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 yes. But so, I don't know about rest versus... Right, so I yeah. think that's the point I would make here is that there, there, are, there is research to support undulating your calories, right? So having high days, low days uh, has values uh, uh, physiologically that right. will benefit you. So already the research points in the direction that there's value in doing that. And then the next layer to that to me would be like, well, where if that's true, then then just eating consistently the exact same thing every single day is less beneficial. So I'm going to intentionally have these higher lower days. Yeah. I'm going to go off of like what I like for me workout days. I tend to want to be fueled more, and that's purely the psychological piece of like I'm fueled, I have more energy, therefore I have a better workout. And then on days when I'm resting, I'm not active as much. I don't need as many calories. Now, mentally though, that can be challenging because you're sitting around, you're not doing anything. And so you're yeah, not like, yeah. you have the tendency the to want to snack. And, yeah. so, for, so for me, I've like found versus getting into the weeds of like, which one gives me percentage more gains with that. It's like, okay, which one makes me a healthier version of myself by disciplining which, myself to be that? Yeah, one? which one works better overall with my behaviors? Yes. Is what to look at. Because you could also make the argument like, oh, rest day is recovery. Eat more calories on the recovery sure. day, you know, type of deal. I guess the qu the answer is it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't no. matter if you decide to do more or less on the rest days. Just base it off of what's going to contribute to better behaviors um, overall. For me, if I was bulking, I would use rest days as days to eat more food. If mm -hmm. I was cutting, mm -hmm. I would be more disciplined on rest days right. because I, I'm already more disciplined on the days I work out. And that's how I would coach my clients. When my clients would ask me this, then I would always follow up with my own questions. Well, what tends to happen on your rest days? How do you feel? Yeah. Do you find because you're not working out, you're more likely to eat 
you know, in ways that aren't so healthy or, um, or do you, do you feel like you need the extra food or would you like to go a little looser on the rest days because of those days you hang out with your friends? It's really about behaviors. Hunter, this out. is what, this is what makes the, the personal training side of this so important is like learning about your client's individual behaviors and tailoring it, the, 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 knowing the research and science and uh, that it supports undulating calories but also understanding the behaviors on the front because I'll, I'll give you an example of where I, I wouldn't care what the science says. Science says undulating is better, but let's say I have a client who's like, Adam, if I just have a number I have to hit every single day, I'm so much better and consistent than that. If you tell me one day I should be higher, another day I should throws be lower, yeah. throws me off, I'm more likely to make bad choices or I, I spiral out of control on these days, then I'm going to tell that person, eat the same every single day. That works for you. You're more consistent. We're going to see that. So it's so important that you understand your own behaviors and tendencies around exercise and training and that you you tailor that around you versus, oh, Andrew Huberman said that you're supposed to do this in the morning by this time and that's what's better. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're not going to adhere to it. Next question is from Ian Weeks. How important is it to have a strong core for the main lifts? Is there a certain percentage more you can expect to lift by strengthening your core? Oh, people who misunder who um, underestimate the ability of your core to contribute to main lifts, uh, it's it's totally silly. Here's my yeah. here's my evidence. Huge right here. performance leak if you're not strong in your core. Oh my god! Here's my evidence right here. Take your max lift without a weight belt. I know. Add a weight belt. <laughs> That's exactly. You've added 30 pounds. That gives you an example of what an artificial core. You're yeah. basically using a belt is giving you an artificially Artificial stability. strong core. Yeah. Yep. And so if you've ever seen the example of what you just said of like squatting without a belt and then now adding a belt, what percentage more gains? Well, imagine if you built that intrinsically, right? Internally, like literally you went out instead of like just putting a belt on, you made a goal to get your core that strong that you could control it that well, that's what you could expect to gain in those lifts. Now, the beauty of the core, if you look at the core musculature, um, there's a lot of things that contribute to core strength and stability. And your core is designed to be very strong. Now, the problem is that people don't intentionally strengthen uh, and, and train their core to the point where- Especially with load, yeah. Yeah, so to the point where They'll get their arms and legs strong, strong enough to move a weight that their core can't support. This is why the most common injury is a low back injury. This mm -hmm. is the, the direct result of core weakness or instability. If your core, and the core is, of course, your abs, obliques, both internal and external, all of the deep uh, core muscles, your lats and your hips also contribute to core stability. Like when you're weak there, um, you could be super strong in your upper body, super strong in your lower body. And if the weak link is going to be your core, either you'll hurt yourself or you're just not going to be able to exert. That's where all the force is going to drive into. Totally. A hundred percent. So and by, by the way, this is true for all sports. You're throwing a baseball, a football, a punch, mm -hmm. running, jumping. It's funny. When I used to train um, marathon runners and triathletes, if I train them, sometimes we would, the, our schedules wouldn't align, whatever. And so I'd have to train them in the morning and then they go do their endurance training later or the day before, which mm -hmm. I, I like to have a day in between, but sometimes it, it would work that way. It was, it was so crazy. This happened more than once where uh, let's say I had a runner. If I train their legs, they'd notice a little bit of reduction in performance. If I train their core, they'd come back to me and be like, dude, my performance sucked. You think a runner, it's all about legs. It's like, no, their their legs could be fatigued when their core was fatigued. They were screwed. They yep. were totally ruined. And if you look at the biomechanics of running, arm goes up, Everything opposite unravels. leg goes. Yeah. Yes. It, it, it's literally the, the the main thing that's keeping everything together. And so, too, you're generating a lot of your power uh, by having that stable core to keep everything fixed while you're in, in locomotion. So, uh, yeah, strengthening the core is is paramount. Yeah. Now, now people are like, okay, what do I do? Crunches, sit up. That's one muscle. You got to rotate. You got to train lateral bending, lateral stability, uh, heavy carries. One of the best things you could do for strong, stable core is really, he really heavy overhead carries, offset carries like that is so good for just strengthening the core to stay stable. Bent presses. Like, yeah, yes. Like oh, oh God. Right. Bent Crip. presses are, yeah. Windmills, those kind of, so it's really important to the point where. I mean, think of the, think of the analogy, I should give like an analogy, like imagine throwing like a standing, balancing on like an inner tube in a pool 
and throwing a ball yeah. versus yeah. standing on no. the ground and yeah. throwing a ball. Like I don't even you don't even have to like go try that to know, oh, I'm gonna throw the ball yeah. way further. Well, that ground is stable, hard, solid ground. It gives, it's not like it has anything to do with the your arm throwing, except for the fact that, that it's a found it's your foundation. Everything's going from there. The same thing goes for your core before you do these lifts. That's what engages and the the stronger, more stable that is, the more force and power you can generate. If you have a weak core, it's like you trying to to throw that ball on a inner tube in the pool. You know, and again, one more thing to add, um, it's not just having strong individual muscles that support the core. That's part of it. <clears throat> it's also that those strong muscles can work together mm -hmm. to create stability through movement. Through multiple variables. And yes. again, this is why like people are always confused. What, what's the value of doing these rotational movements? What's the value of la lateral movements or with counter, weights or yeah. counter rotation? Yeah. yeah, all these types of things. Well, you know, th this is really where the, the core has a lot of responsibility in keeping you stable and strong uh, in any sort of, uh, against any uh, force that's, that's uh, you know, you're, you're battling against. And so um, to, to be able to go through those movements and stay strong and stable and grounded and be able to anchor yourself uh, within uh, that space, uh, you know, your core is highly responsible. For you know that. why, you know why I think one of the challenges is, is it seems obvious to have strong arms and legs because we use them, we move them. Yeah, It's not so obvious to have the support system being really strong. So, I mean, so much give, emphasis is I'll placed. give you a real yeah. real world example of how this, I, I was punished for this just recently. So uh, we did Universal Studios and uh, I, I have, since Katrina's accident and everything like that, or her situation, whatever, their ER, we I've had almost four weeks off of like lifting. Two times I think I've lifted in, almost, in, a, in a month's time. Well, we go to Universal Studios and not only that, I admittedly, uh, I neglect core training already in itself. So I already neglect it as it is, but at least when I'm heavy deadlifting, squatting, I'm getting some yeah. work there. Well, I've had almost a month off. We go to Universal Studios, having my son just on my shoulders just destroyed my low back. And that's because normally that wouldn't happen because if I- I've Yeah, your legs weren't tired. Yeah, my your legs- shoulders weren't tired. Yeah, nothing else is tired, but my low back was tired. Well, why is it? Well, I've got a kid on my shoulders compressing my spine, no activation in my core supporting me. Whereas when I've been training it, it's strong, I'm braced. Yep. And the weight of him is not a heavy weight for me, but it's just that little bit of compression down on me and the- flimsy weak core that i have at this current moment and then it stresses my lower back like crazy it's like that's such a small example but of like real world how that impacts like your overall strength now it's crazy how just a short period of time of neglecting yeah. that how 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 much the detriments of that can be next question is from kimberly jorgensen 25 how can I stop trap engagement while doing back exercises? So let me rephrase this question because yeah, you, you can't because the traps are involved in stabilizing yeah. the, the the shoulder blades. But I think what they're asking is, how can I stop feeling this in my upper traps right. when I do exercises like like rows? So here's why this happens, first of all. Shrugging. Yeah. So the reason why this happens is because forward shoulder is super common. Uh, people tend to have kind of this forward shoulder position. The muscles that pull their shoulder blades back or that drop their shoulder blades tend to be weak, but the body still needs to sh stabilize your shoulders. And so the, mm -hmm. what it does is it calls on other muscles. And one of the muscles that it calls on are the upper traps. That's why people get tight yeah. up in here Just and tend to like massage up here, right? It's like these kind of stay tight. And the reason why they're tight is just trying to stabilize your shoulders. So then you go to the gym and you're like, oh, I heard rows are really good for my back. So then you go do a row and your body just does what it always does, which is stabilize, stabilize by, it now go. And so then it looks like this. Yeah. So you do this upper, this kind of shrug row and your shoulders even roll forward a little mm -hmm. bit. So the way to get rid of this is to go really light. Mm -hmm. When you do your row, bring your shoulder blades back and down. Like you're trying to put your shoulder blades in your back pocket and hold that squeeze position and get used to doing that. And you have to go light because as soon as you go heavy, your body's going to go back to what it does best, which is shrug the shoulders. This was like one of my go-tos with a brand new client. A, yeah. a, a easy way for me to show my value. Super I, common too. Yeah, I'd get behind them. I'd press on their traps, yep. make them feel better. Then we do a row. I put my hand on the shoulders, shoulders back and down, hold this position. We do, you know, seven, eight reps, let go of the weight. They'd stand up and they'd be like, oh my God, I have no more tension yeah. in my neck. And I'd be like, hire me for 20 sessions. Um, but really <laughs> yeah. it's just... Train really train the shoulder blades down and back 
to kind of offset that upper, you know, upper. Yeah. Cut. I like to do that too. And just, um, uh, get in that postural position first and then hold weights. So a lot of times just having those weights as resistance to kind of help prime that, uh, response and to, to keep those muscles engaged in that position and create tension. Like a farmer walk. Or like a farmer that. walk, but you, I mean, not even doing the walk portion of it, but just kind of prepping you and then going over to yeah. sit down and do a seated row. Sometimes people just can't even, don't even have that kind of muscle connection yet to kind of build that. You have to move them and you got to move them literally. Yeah. And like, uh, you put your, your knee in someone's back and pull their shoulders back. To yeah, oh, it, take, I, it takes work, so it's so it's it's frustrating. I but. remember a client that was like so forward like that that I couldn't. He was so he was this big. Jack You're like dude. leaning and pushing. Oh, I had my and, knee yeah. in there, and I'm like pulling. And like that, I couldn't yeah. even like get him back. I was like, oh my god, this is <laughs> we're gonna be here for a while. You yeah. know, for advanced people, uh, really good exercise for something like this is to do an overhead dumbbell hold while what's called packing the shoulder. Pack it. That is really hard to do. Yep. For a lot of people yeah. where they, they, you know, if they put their arm up, they shrug, try to drop the shoulder while your arm is extended and then hold another hard one. Really good the, for shoulder what's health. What's the, uh, yes. what do you call the one that you do on the pull-up bar where you basically are making the, you're basically scapulous, oh, scapular, scapular circles, scapula, yeah. circles um, with the hanging or, I mean, even doing like just a scapular, scapular push-ups. Push -ups. Yeah. yeah. There's a good way to do yeah, that. Those which, are, those are difficult to difficult. engage. It, it looks looks like it's super easy because you're not bending your elbows and uh but you're dropping your body down it just helps you to kind of get connectivity well there. what's great about it though is that is it highlights how how disconnected you are to that area because it's not physically hard like it's not you're not doing heavy weight yeah. you're supporting your upper body is not a lot that's not challenging but just the fact that it's challenging to do that should highlight to you like oh wow this is how disconnected uh, or lack of good connection i have here uh, and needs what's, to be worked what people on. need to understand is when you develop a what's called a movement pattern that pattern in order to to change that pattern to something that's better so in this case bad pattern uh, you know my shoulders are shrugged all the time or my upper traps are tense and i want to stop that because i'm always tight in my neck and if i do back exercise i feel it in the wrong place you can't go hard with your workouts because the second you push your body does what it does best, which is this position right here. That's actually where you're strongest at the moment. So you have to go light to teach it something else and then slowly build strength. And then eventually you surpass your strength because now you're moving better. But it's good to, to know that because people will do an exercise, they'll push with intensity, and then they can't figure out why they don't feel in the right place. Like Because your body won't move that way when it's hard. It moves, over, it moves this way when it's hard. We got to go easy first before we can go hard. Next question is from Hannah Rufenacht. How do you teach your kids about health and fitness? I want my kids to be healthy, but I don't want them to develop an unhealthy relationship with exercise, diet, or their bodies. God, this is a tough one because Lead they by said example. it. They, yeah, they said it, right? The, the risk is uh, uh, giving them a unhealthy relationship because you put too much of an emphasis on eating a particular way. So now they put that pressure on themselves. They have to look a particular way or be a particular way. And then, of course, the other side of it is uh, no structure whatsoever. Um, I think the, the, the best understanding is to invite your children to eat healthy and to exercise, not to push them mm -hmm. into exercise I and, 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 uh, and, and good nutrition. And the way you do that is just by the way you live. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't think this is actually hard at all. I think this is actually very easy. What's difficult is being consistent with this, which is, this is how we eat. This is what mom and dad do, right? You I don't, don't even have to say that if that's how you. Well, are. that's what I mean. Yeah. I'm saying that to you yeah, yeah. that your actions show that. Like, I don't tell Max, "Hey, come out in the garage and let's lift weights." Like, he, I go lift weights. Mm -hmm. Doors and open. He's hanging out with. Yeah, him. He, doors open. He's out there playing yeah. and doing his thing. And Katrina and I are lifting weights. And I'm not. And now, if he comes over and he wants to try and lift the bar, we'll have some fun and we'll play some. But I'm not like, "Hey, come over here. Let's try and do this." Or can you, I'm not even challenge. I don't even care. Like, he, just him seeing his that his dad and mom do this thing yeah. consistently. And then same thing goes with the food part. Uh, he doesn't see us eat cake and cookie and treats and candy on that. We don't have that several house. We do on holidays or we do on very special occasions, but 95% of the time, the rest of the year, he sees us sit down and he eats what we eat. And so we don't eat out a bunch of fast food places at all. We eat, we make most of our meals at home. And so it's like, this is what we have for dinner. We all eat this. And so I think the hardest part about this is your own discipline mm -hmm. is the consistency. Can you be consistent 
about train doing that. And then that's all you got to do. You don't need to be, if you are, and if you are that person, you eat healthy, whole foods, you exercise every day. You ain't got to say shit. You ain't got to tell your kids. You don't. They, it's part of your life. It's mm -hmm. how it's how the family eats. It's how the actions family speak louder than words. It's like that's always been true. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's it, yeah, and it, I mean that's what it revolves around. But uh, I think making it fun, right? Like they see that you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think is a big factor to that too. And that's just something that develops over time, where they garner more interest in what you're doing, why you're doing it. Uh, you can help kind of educate them along the way when they ask and they're curious. Uh, cause naturally it's going to evoke some kind of curiosity as to why you're always going down to the garage and you're, you're picking up weights and, uh, you know, and they too, they want to kind of test themselves. And so it's just been a natural process of, uh, and, and I don't even know that they know a whole lot about like health and fitness just yet, you know, right. I, but they know enough to where they've seen, you know, why we choose to eat this or why we choose to go do this on a consistent basis. Uh, and, uh, you know, later on, it'll all start to kind of form. Look, you grow up in a house with people who smoke, the odds that you're going to smoke are much higher. Same thing with drinking, same thing with playing sports, same thing with watching TV, same thing with exercising, same thing with everything. What they're around becomes their culture, their home culture. And that's what they learn. Now to take it a step further, to get a little bit more specific with this, number one, you have to be okay with your kid not liking what's in front of them and let them make choices. You want to give your child, this is something I learned later on. You want to give them a sense of autonomy to choose in kind of their own destiny. But you, what you do is you limit the choices. This is how you have control as a parent. So you make a plate and this is what you do with really little kids, not when they're older, but when they're really little, like one years old, two years old, you take six different things, you put on the plate, put it in front of them, let them eat what they want. And every once in a while you introduce something new and you keep reintroducing enough and they, end up trying it. But it really is about how they watch mom and dad and how they live. I, I, I you know, I, I remember very well, there were two times this happened to me. One time in particular, a client came in who was working out with me and she walks in with her eight or nine year old little boy and he had chicken nuggets and they sat down and say anything. It's like, whatever you're eating chicken nuggets. And she brings me to her son and she goes, Sal, can you tell him explain to him why chicken nuggets are unhealthy. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I bit my lip. And I said, yeah, hold on. I said, can I talk to you for a second? She said, I walked over. I said, who bought him the chicken nuggets? She's like, I did. I said, that's not my job to tell him <laughs> what he, what's good and what's not. I said, that's, you're the one that buys the food. You're the one that dictates yeah. that. And I said, he's going to follow your lead. And then she got a little annoyed with me, but it was the truth. It's like, <laughs> well, I don't, it's did you have a job? Either. Did you go buy the nuggets? Like, uh, so it really is about that example. It's that's the hardest part of this whole that's thing. It. Like it's, whatever you it's don't already like hard to be consistent as adults. Yeah. Like to, so it's like you, adults trying to focus on what they need to tell or do to their kids is far less important than the consistency around your own habits and behaviors. Like what are you like you if if ice cream and candy doesn't exist in the house, you're not going to have 95% of your child's youth is in your house. <laughs> you're like, so they're not going to be surrounded by those challenges and it's not going to be normal behavior for them to have those I, things because I, yeah. you don't have, those. I have it's all this, just theory unless they see the application. Yeah. I have you this can speak, the, you know, whatever you want. To totally. Them. I have this challenge with, uh, recently with electronics is I have teenage kids too, and I want them off their electronics more. And I'm like, I got to be off mine more. Right. Like, you know, what am I going to, I'm going to be on my phone while telling them to yep. come off their phone. Like, right. Yeah, you know, and people don't like to hear that. Parents don't like to hear that because they don't want to do it. <laughs> that's just the thing. Yeah. yeah. I that's mean, that's how I feel about trying this, to disconnect this, from it. This exercise can't. and nutrition stuff. It's the same thing. It's like now there, I do uh, probably the only thing I would be cautious of is if you are the fitness fanatic uh, already and you already have extremely healthy food and, and you're asking this also, it's like, yeah. well, then you don't need to do anything. Just live your life and allow your kid to to watch yes, you. Yes, because consider last thing you want to do is micromanage that yeah. as a kid too. Yes, yeah. because consider this: there are more eating disorders in the fitness community than there are outside of. That's it. right, and you can create the opposite yes. problem by making this like everything and placing a lot of focus on it. It has to be kind of this. That's all you, you, yeah. you. I do not. We do not do any telling Max uh, to work out or that we're, we don't make a big deal about us doing it whatsoever. And the food thing, even all the way back to when he was one or two, it's like he ate what we ate. So he would see literally mom eating and then sharing to you. It's yeah. like 
there, so there wasn't like this weird like I don't want that I want something else it's like <laughs> that wasn't even yeah. a thing it was like yeah. we all eat this is what we're eating and then we're just consistent with that it's like this gets really murky when you're inconsistent with your behaviors your nutrition your exercise and then yet you want to instill these things in the kid it's like well man nothing's going to move that needle more than you being consistent with your own by the way just wait till you have teenagers and you tell them to do something and they point out that you did the same Mm -hmm. exact thing (laughs) well what about you you didn't do that okay right Right. nice lesson look if you like the show go to mindpumpfree.com and check out our free guides we have a free guide that can teach you how to squat like a pro teaches everything you know to get a squat that looks amazing you can also find us on instagram justin is at mindpumpjustin I'm at Mind Pump to Stefano and Adam's at Mind Pump Adam. 